Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second edition of Working Rangelands Wednesdays. We're doing a series of webinars on a whole variety of topics regarding uh, working rangelands in California and throughout the West. And we're spending these first several weeks talking about drought and rangeland agriculture. Uh, my name is Dan Macon. I am the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor for Placer, Nevada, Sutter, and Yuba County with UC Cooperative Extension. I'm Leslie Roach, a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Rangeland Science and Management with the University of California, Davis. And I'm Grace Woodmancy. I'm a grad student at Davis Management, and Leslie and Dan are my advisors. And before we jump in, um, I do want to ask if you would uh, keep your microphones and your video cameras on mute. Um, that will help preserve bandwidth for, for the presenters today. If you have questions as we go through the panel discussion or when we get to the end, if you would enter those into the chat box, um, Leslie will be monitoring the chat and will synthesize questions for our panelists at the end of their, their panel discussion. Leslie, is there anything I'm leaving out here? Or are we are we ready to go? I think we're ready to go, Dan. All right. So uh, we were just talking as we were getting started here today about um, rangeland drought and the fact that uh, even though we had a lot of rain here in the Sierra foothills in the last couple of days, we continue to face drought conditions. This is the most recently published California Drought Monitor map, and it shows that. Uh, here in Northern California, we are at least in a moderate drought, if not in um, severe to extreme drought. And so we thought it was timely to look back at some of the lessons that we've learned um, from the last drought and, um, and talk to some ranchers that have been coping with drought throughout their career. So with that, um, I'd like to invite our rancher panelists to uh, unmute their microphones. And um, we'll start with this first question. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your operations, where you're located, what you produce, um, how you market what you produce, <coughs> and then kind of the, the percentage of owned versus leased land that you operate on? And I think, Melissa, we'll start with you. So how about um, it? Um, tell me if I'm too quiet, because I don't have a great speaking voice. Okay. Um, so we, we run our operation 100% on leased land. It's, uh, we don't own any of it. Um, our primary focus is dairy. We run a very small scale uh, dairy and we direct market Jersey milk. Um, and we're uh, running our cows on pasture year round um, with a pretty decent amount of supplemental hay during the summer. But um, we lease uh, 95 acres. Um, Placerville, California, and about 12 of those are irrigated. Um, and, uh, you know, besides the direct marketed dairy, we also do a little bit of targeted grazing. We've got about um, 198 sheep uh, right now, and we're kind of working towards a goal of increasing our flock and increasing um, the amount of targeted grazing that we're doing. Um, but we, uh, we have additional land that we work with that's not officially leased. Um, but that 95 acres is our, our home, home base. Um, How big is your total land base, Melissa, including the stuff that you don't officially lease? Um, well, we've got uh, 70 acres that we can use if we need to nearby. We've got um, 900 acres that is kind of in a, it's a little bit of an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> We're partnering with somebody uh, this year to help them to learn to do managed grazing and um, potentially move towards having their own targeted grazing business. Um, and we're gonna be working with them to implement some management and some grazing on that uh, parcel or portion of their, um, you know, working with them to, to see if that's what they wanna do with their the acreage that they've got, so. And one last question for you, what is the name of your operation? Um, our farm is, uh, the dairy is Freehand Farm, okay. and the grazing business is Anus. Uh, it looks kind of like Angus, but it's not. It's Anus, <laughs> which is Latin for lamb. Great, great. 
Well, thank you and welcome. Jeff Clark, um, tell us a little bit about uh, your operation, where you are, what you raise, how you market, et cetera. Yeah, I'd be glad to. And that's like a multifaceted question, especially for an operation kind of like ours. So I kind of went through earlier and wrote, wrote some stuff down so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> uh, but basically, I work for a fifth generation ranching family um, that's been ranching here in the Montezuma Hills area, uh, close to Rio Vista, California um for over 100 years and so my uh, title here is breeding herd division manager the company is basically comprised of three divisions we have my division the breeding herd which um is made up of our u flock um, our angus maternal cow herd and our terminal cow herd um, we have our feeder cattle and feeder lamb division uh, that's based up near dixon on irrigated pasture um, and that all that pasture is in close proximity to our sheep feedlot, which would be the third division of the company. Um, so I'm going to focus mainly on my division here, um, which I think is probably the most affected by the drought, seeing as all of my ground is dry ground. Um, and uh, I think it has the most uh, kind of offer to this conversation. So I'm glad to be here, glad to be a part of it. Um, and uh, your uh, your second piece to that question was basically how do we market um, market our animals? So all the lambs are sold direct to Superior Farms. Um, we don't sell a lamb off the place unless it's fat and headed to Superior, um, and that's been the way this family's operated forever. We have a really strong relationship with Superior, and uh, we're we're very thankful they're still around and they chose to remodel that packing plant they have there in Dixon, uh, California, and invest in the California uh, market. Um, and uh, our feeder cattle, I'll talk about that, but like I said, it's it's not my forte, but most of our feeder cattle um, are sold through, we have a really good relationship with our Western Video Market rep, and he'll, he has his contacts, and we'll market cattle um, direct to Agri-Beef or JBS, and I'm talking, you know, eight, 50 to nine weight cattle off a of pasture. Um, and uh, we, we normally will go back to the last company that purchased those feeder cattle and offer them up to them again. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll check, check the market if it's a fair offer. A lot of times we'll, we'll kind of try and keep that relationship going until we feel the need to, to make a change. Um, as far as our calves go from the breeding herd division, all of our heifer calves um, from our, maternal herd which is our it's basically a purebred angus herd but nothing's registered i mean it's angus cows with angus bulls um to produce our our maternal cows for the whole operation so a third of our cows which is about 500 cows are all angus bred to angus bulls to produce our replacement females um, so all those are retained and what we typically will do is ship them up to our irrigated pasture closer to dixon to grow um, over the summer um, and then we'll AI them up there and ship them back to the hills uh, to cab out um, in our in our uh, dry ground area. Um, so on that, the the other half of that calf crop from our maternal herd is obviously uh, going to be you know male. So we'll cut them into steers. We'll ship them up, and typically um, until the last couple of years, we've just run them, mixed them in with our commercial cattle in the feeder operation um, and a few years ago we started throwing around the idea of marketing those cattle separate on the video just because they are ranch raised um, we pay a lot of attention to um, you know the type of bulls we buy and and it's it's kind of a fine balance in performance and maternal traits that you kind of want to balance um, balance out there but our cattle typically do quite well in the feedlot. And um, we, we noticed that when we retained them and fed them out. So we decided to start offering them as a bunch um, of ranch raised cattle on the August uh, Western video market sale. And it's worked out uh, pretty well the last couple of years. Except, well, actually with the exception of this past year, because four days prior, there was the Tyson fire uh, prior to the August sale. And so we, we kind of got hammered this last year, but we'll be back this year again. And um, it's, it's been a good market outlet for those calves. 
Um, moving on, um, the terminal herd is comprised of roughly a thousand cows. It fluctuates 1,200 to 800, depending on uh, feed conditions in the year. Um, that are all Angus-based cows bred terminally to Wagyu bulls. Um, they're all a part of that Snake River Farms American Kobe Beef Program, and so those are pre-contracted before they're even bred and sold back to Agri Beef um, up there in Idaho. So they'll ship to American Falls. Idaho, um, all those cattle are NHTC, non-hormone treated, um, and China, source and age verified, um, which is a requirement for us uh, in, that, in that program. And so um, they're all process verified cattle and, and pre-contracted and sold back to them. Um, but I mean, it, you know, and we talk about cold cows and bulls um, throughout the year. If we have some of those come up, we'll just haul them to the local sales yard um, there to gulp. Um, but, um, in, when we do our main preg checks, which typically has been in June this year, it was, uh, it's right now basically. Um, but uh, we'll get into that later, but at any rate, um, we would hang on to those coals, um, and we would run them if we had extra feed somewhere for a little while longer, put a little more flesh on them, let the bag kind of shrink up to take that weight out of the bag. And then we would sort those uh, and sell them on a yield grade basis to a packer down in Fresno. And if you sort those right, it's worked out tremendously for us um, with bringing a slight premium over what cold cows are bringing in the barn. But right now, this year, with the way prices have jumped up in the last couple of weeks and everything, we're shipping directly to Gulf and we'll be better off just shipping everything that way. Um, I guess the last piece I would add is when we do keep retain those heifers and we put them through our program, we uh, develop them to breeding age, we'll AI them, anything that comes up open at that point on our preg check after AI, we will then sell uh, into a grass fed uh, company that is located near us and they'll run them for an extra few months and then typically they'll be able to kill those pretty quick. So. And Jeff, just one last quick question. What percent of your grazing land is leased versus owned, roughly? So it's an interesting dynamic we have there because basically 100% of it is leased um, from our company standpoint. But as I said, it's a family business. So uh, the fifth generation rancher that I work for, um, his mom owns most of the land we run on so it's kind of all in the family but it's still everything's separate and we lease 100 percent of that that land and I, I didn't even go into that but we have 16,000 acres of dry ground that we operate on um and roughly uh we couple thousand irrigated acres around the feedlot um up there in dixon um and uh that uh Yep, pretty much covered everything. Oh, the only numbers I didn't give you is our ewe flock. We run typically 4,000 ewes and they stay up on the dry ground uh, for the duration of their life. And so we uh, uh, multi-species graze them with, with our cows um, extensively. Um, and uh, the sheep are a huge part of our business. Um, we really feel they add a lot of value and um, help us raise more pounds of protein per, per acre, which pays the bills. So. Great, great. Thank you, Jeff, very much. And Joe, we'll, we'll go on to you now. Let's, let's, let's hear where you're from and what you do. Thanks, Dan. Uh, first, I'd say, though, is it's really interesting. We only have three producers here, and, and I think what's going to be really intriguing and unique about this panel is you're going to see three different types of management strategies, and you're going to see three different regional drought implications. And, and I already know because I talked to Jeff quite a bit of, of some of the actions they've taken this year, and we've had a completely different scenario here where we've kept calves on longer because of feed resources and just how how regionalized our rain patterns have become in California and maybe it's always been that way and I just haven't paid attention to it but I do think that that our precipitation is coming more regionalized and more unpredictable so it'll be fun to explore that but um, uh, my wife and I graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 2005 moved here in Auburn to manage Bruin Ranch, which is a purebred Angus operation, about 300 mother cows we run. We retain a lot of the replacement heifers, and um, I, 
I'm reluctant to say what percentage of bulls I'll shoot and say 75%, but sometimes <laughs> it's more, sometimes it's less, just depending on how things happen. Um, those bulls will get developed as long as we can here at Bruin Ranch and then get shipped to Lucy Snyder's feedlot in Urington, Nevada, where we market them annually at a bull sale in Ione um, in conjunction with Circle Ranches. Um, he provides some Angus bulls and we provide the Angus component of that sale every year. We'll sell some cattle privately. We sell some females through that sale. Um, we run a pretty diverse uh, operation in the foothills when it comes to the type of rangeland that we have. Uh, all told, we run on about 8,000 acres, 800 of which would be deeded. And I didn't get into the actual numbers because even an Oki like me can figure out that math. It'd be about 10% owned and um, the rest private, both uh, from private individuals and then also um, from government I don't even know how to say, from Fish and Wildlife and um, public, I guess you'd say, right? Mm -hmm. Public lands. Yep. And um, it's been good to really cultivate those relationships, both public and private. And, um, and then also some of, the, some of the grazing that we do on our own place is, is through land trusts and conservation groups. Um, so it, it's been fun to, to really see so many different diverse groups all working towards similar goals and then balance those goals with the different rain and management techniques that we have throughout the state. Um, have four kids too. I should mention that they help with the operation quite a bit whenever they can when they they're homeschooled but um, that doesn't mean they get to help me all the time unfortunately. Uh, but we we enjoy this life, we enjoy this lifestyle and we enjoy trying to improve the the people and the environment around us. That's kind of our passion. Um, and and I should say that genetically speaking we really really try to match our cattle with the environment and try to produce a product that can go out and work for folks whose whose operations are very similar to ours. They're they're just cattlemen and women across the state who utilize a large percentage of rangeland, very few with permanent pasture or irrigated land. Um, we do, I, I didn't mention that, about 6% of what we have um, is irrigated ground that would provide 50% of the forage. So it'll be really fun later on to explore the drought implications of that, both as a buffer but then we have to rely on um, water storage, either through snowpack or actual caught and reservoir rainfall, because we do not pump out of the ground for, well, I guess we do for 12 acres, but in the big scheme of things, it's, it's inconsequential for us. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to visit this, and, and I see a lot of familiar names. If, if I have uh, Maddie, if I have an email I haven't responded to, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, thank you all for being here. Well, thank you all for that introduction. And I, I think that kind of lays the groundwork for, for this next question. Um, what are the key lessons you learned from the last drought? You know, how, how has your operation changed since 2015 or 2016 um, because of the last drought? I'll just throw that open to the three of you. What, what did you learn and, and what's changed for you? Melissa, go ahead. Um, okay, so when that last drought was ending, we were just starting up our own business. Um, and most of our experience of the drought was actually, well, the first half of it, we weren't even in California, we were on the East Coast, and we were having the opposite issue. We had a super um, extra wet uh, season. And then we came back to California, and we lived in a little um, valley in San Benito County at that time, and it was a very low rainfall area already. Like their average, a, a good rain year for them is like seven inches um, total. And the first year that we were there, we got less than one inch of rain. Um, and it was pretty educational uh, because a lot of those pastures around us, um, you know, it was all basically dry land. Nobody was irrigating pasture where we were, um, at least in that particular little valley. Uh, but it was a lot of set stock grazing. Um, and everybody, I think at that point, had destocked pretty heavily. But uh, it, it was very um, eye-opening to see that if you hadn't planned really well for that uh, super low forage production, uh, if you went into it, you know, destocking too late, you really were screwed up for many years to come because that area is not, you know, it's not going to bounce back really fast. Um, when we would see a rain hit, it would you would see the areas that were 
set stock graze, you know, there'd be like very, very few animals out there, but because they had, you know, it was just basically dirt in a lot of places, um, bare soil, you get a very tiny regrowth of fillery, and that was about it. Or, um, areas where animals were not set stocked or, um, you know, things that were fenced out, the, the in between the road and the, um, barbed wire, there was a lot more forage coming up. Um, and so it was, you know, really clear that you could, with planning, um, potentially have a lot more forage than uh, what we were seeing around us. Um, so that was kind of cemented in our minds that you have to, you have to have a plan before it happens. Um, and you need to make sure that if you're gonna destock or, or change your management, you're doing it prior to having dirt for forage you know, that the result was really um, pretty nasty there. Um, so that was a, uh, that's kind of how we, we experienced it. And we were really, at that time, we were working um, with a dry lot dairy, so it didn't really affect us financially or, you know, we didn't have our own business. Um, and the place that we were working for was not relying on forage in that area. Um, they were getting it from out of state. So uh, another thing we saw when it would green up, you know, that first green up, a lot of people would lose cattle to bloat um, or, you know, it just seemed like they, they would be holding steady through the, the dry period. And as soon as there was a little bit of green and they threw everybody out there, um, uh, we'd see a lot of bloated cattle on, <laughs> out in the pastures or, you know, with legs up in the air and um that kind of made us think about you know that aspect of planning as well like you have to have planning for when the drought breaks because um there's going to be uh i think there's mineral uptake issues probably that happen with those plants um and i think that mineral uptake uh change changes uh, the nutrition for the animals and so you have to be extra sensitive to that that was kind of what we that was what we took away from seeing that happen. Um, so planning and management seem to be really key and it needs to be set up before it happens, before the drought hits. And Joe, maybe I'll put you on the spot a little bit. I seem to recall a, a text um, probably in January, 2014 that I got from you showing me the protein tubs that you'd fed in December and January. Um, so I know the drought was a big deal for you. Maybe you could kind of walk us through what the key takeaway was. Or... It was. Um, and, you know, when you, when you make the choice to be a high input operation, um, which means just tons of supplements and, and not using your native forages and what God and moisture gives you, um, drought isn't that bad of a deal hmm. because it's not muddy. You just go out and you continue to haul feed to critters, but as long as you're going to harvest what's given to you and you're going to utilize and work within these landscapes and these ecosystems, it can be quite a challenge. Um, I, I made some notes while Melissa was talking and good points, Melissa. I know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot as a group and, and it's been really fun to, to share that. Yeah, I always say over on the coast because I send some bulls over there. They can be from drought to bloat in seven days. And, and it's not a joke. I mean, if you get the right rain and the right conditions, you can be from starving cattle to tipping them over. Um, it really made me realize that we're not in the animal business. Um, we're in the people business and then the grass growing business. And um, I think that if we can go into it with conservatively stocked numbers, I, I had an old friend who passed away this last year actually. And, and he always told me, he said, you'll run out of money before you run out of cattle to buy. And, um, He's exactly right. So there is a rangeland adaptability component there that we're always mindful of and we're always trying to breed the right kind of cattle. But um, I think sometimes, I think in general, in terms of fully functioning ecosystems, processes and, and water uptake especially, if we ran most of these ranches at about five to 10% less of their full carrying capacity, that'd be great drought insurance for the most part. And, and I think it would definitely help with the amount of water that we can absorb and the amount of carbon we sequester. Um, another note I made here is don't be a victim. I think that there are a lot of victims of drought and uh, I think it's a very proactive approach. And even those of us who were extremely proactive and thinking about it and watching and, 
and trying to to plan and bank forage and save forage we still were at nature's mercy so to speak um but i think that without a plan you just create that precedent of being a victim and we did have a plan we had a plan this year um we started out with as great a fall as we maybe ever had and then the rain shut off and i went from man we don't have enough cattle to i'm going to be selling cattle and then um then you get another pop of rain and you kind of think well this will get us through the first part of march and then it turns really cold and windy and continues to get dry and and um, I think conservative is the best approach. Another thing that I have here is call early and call often. Um, it doesn't work if you aren't running in, in a, a dual forage environment like we are with, with both irrigated pasture and native rangeland. I should say rangeland, right? Native is not probably correct term. There's probably a handful of species out there, but you guys know what I'm getting at. Um, rangeland. So that gives us an opportunity. When we go on to rangeland in December, we cull rigorously and we cull hard. And it, it really has become a great marketing point for us as a purebred operation because people that follow our program know that we're ruthless. If, if anything looks at us wrong, we don't have the forage to, to keep those animals on. And, and I also say that every single animal has to add value. If she's an embryo recipient, she needs to be packing an embryo pregnancy. If she's if she's an AI cow, she needs to be bred in the first 45 days of the breeding season. And then we adjust that based upon what we think our forage availability is going to be. And if we think that we have more forage, like right now we have a windfall of summer feed, we're keeping some late bred cows because the market's not great. And we'll mark those cattle as we get to peak ET in July. And we're concerned about keeping up with our irrigation schedule, then we'll offload those cattle. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the biggest one is don't be a victim. Come up with a plan and have yourself some critical dates. And even if your critical date is, I'm going to make a decision by this date, that's a critical date. Um, and so luckily this, this year, um, and, and I had plenty of conversation with many of our landlords who have different goals, um, both again, public and private, um, where we say, hey, we're going to have to get out of here for ecological reasons, or we're going to have to get out of here for cattle health reasons. And then all of a sudden the gears change, boom, you're in reverse and you have to load up again because of fuel load. And um, that stuff happens and that's ranching. And, and we all just need to be mindful of that if we have ecology at the forefront of our minds. And I, I do believe this. I mean, we've, I've been, I've had it drilled into my head since, um, my great grandfather, um, his family would have homesteaded in Calaveras County in the 1850s and 60s. And one thing that he, I was, I was fortunate enough, I got to know him very, very, I was very young. I think I was nine or 10 when he died, but, but people like that, you always remember certain things they say. And uh, he, he always said, there's always a shortage of ground. They're not making any more of it by as much as you can. And he also said, take care of the ground and it'll take care of you. And, um, and I believe that if we take care of these landscapes and, and we try to work within them and not force them into something um, that fit our particular production goals, then, then it kind of comes to us, if, if, if I don't, for lack of a better term. Um, so drought, uh, another thing that I would just add on my little rant here, uh, <laughs> drought, climate change, weather patterns, I don't, sustainability, I don't know why we take all these terms that have very literal scientific definitions and meanings and politicize them and ruin a good term. Um, and drought seems to be the one that everybody gets mad about now. And we do live in a drought state. And I think that anybody, you know, I, I did chuckle Dan when on the email for our prep questions, it says 2011 to 15. I know that that's the official drought, but I don't ever remember getting out of it. I mean, I feel like it's been a struggle since I've been here to figure out a, a stable weather pattern for Auburn, California. Um, we went from 2005, six, seven, somewhere in there. We had 92 inches of precipitation recorded one of those winters. And then we had other ones that were in the teens. And so the only answer I have is, is conservative grass management which becomes a challenge. I mean, it, it does with us in our proximity and anybody that's ever been to Bruin Ranch know that it's a, it's a fire hotbed, right? And so we strategically have to graze aggressively on some key areas that might have higher risk and then try to bank forage in those other areas because um, you just can't 
I mean, it sounds really neat to have a click of a mouse and say, okay, we're going to depopulate these cattle by 30%, and then next year we need to increase by 30%. E even if you said that it was all equal and you could get cattle to rangeland adapt, let's just take that part out of the equation and the genetics out of the equation. We don't have the capital to do that. I mean, and, and not to mention all of the financial repercussions of depopulating to that extent and then repopulating them. It, it just doesn't work. So um, we stay conservative, we, we co-aggressive, and we plan. Those are our three. Jeff, maybe you can build on that a little bit. I think in your intro, you talked about a particular subset of the cow herd kind of fluctuates from 800 to 1200, depending on, on the year. What did you guys take away from the last drought? Um, how has that changed Amy livestock? So I started making a list when I got this question because um, I started here right at the end of that that season. Um, so right in that 2015, right, you know, 2015, 2016 right there. Um, and to be honest, um, I mean, it. I have two pages of changes uh, that we've made uh, since then. And I think part of it was um, when I when I took this position, um, I basically kind of became a liaison between the current owner and his grandfather, who was the owner of the company prior to uh, selling it to his grandson. Um, and I mean, and, and uh, his grandfather is just an incredible wealth of knowledge. Um, he's been running sheep and cattle in California for years. And I mean, at one point he was well over, you know, 20,000 ewes, um, and, and ran quite a few cattle as well. So he had a lot, he had a lot to, um, that I gleaned basically from conversations with him, but, um, Ryan Mahoney, who owns our company currently, um, he's, he's allowed us to make some really good changes, some progressive changes that have really, um, kind of, I kind of consider it risk management in a way, a lot of these changes we make, um, because they, they, a lot of them have reduced our downward potential. Um, but we made the decision to reduce kind of that downward, uh, potential and, and it's inadvertently increased our production efficiency um, almost tenfold. I mean, when, when I started here, the, our cattle, our sheep, um, nothing had an ear tag in it at all. So talk about easy, you know, an easy way to, to gain a little efficiency. How about we get rid of the dry cows at the end of the year in the, in the right dry cows? Cause it's, you know, you might think it's that one with the spot next to its eye and go out and gather that Well, she weaned a heavy calf and it was, you know, it was this other cow. So, um, I mean, honestly, just getting back to the basics of preg checking your cows every year, um, they weren't preg checking. And if they did, they preg, they basically do a spot preg check where they preg check, you know, 10% of the herd. And if it went well, they wouldn't preg check the rest and just run those cows until the next year, sort the dries out and, you know, you'd sell those. Um, but all, all in that period of time too, if you have problems, you're grafting calves to cows that lost their calf because they weren't a good mom. And then you're keeping that one another year and you have these like consistent, you know, cows that are causing you problems you're keeping year after year. So Anyway, just getting uh, ear tags in them and electronic tags has been a big deal. Um, you know, uh, preg checking, like I said, all the cows and the sheep annually, they never preg, check, preg checked any of the sheep. They would just, we'd sort dries, um, like I was saying about the cows. So um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to list quite a few things we changed here in a minute, but the main point of of my entire answer to this question is basically increasing our production efficiency, not keeping anything around that's not making us money longer than we absolutely have to. Um, uh, the other thing we've done is we've invested in infrastructure. So increasing the safety for our workers um, and our animals um, in some of the facilities that we had for shipping, preg checking, branding calves, that sort of thing, um, that's paid dividends. I mean, a workers' comp claim can cost you as much as a drought, you know, uh, in any given year. And so eliminating some of those risks um, has really helped us. And we've seen a, 
a large reduction in in our workers comp um, insurance premium because of that um, so along with that um, let's see here quality so our focus has been on quality so if we go from uh, running you know basically uh, everything we can to focusing on those efficient and productive animals um, we decided to focus on quality well in, in California and you know Dan in the sheep industry um, take wool for example that's an easy one we've maintained a fine wool sheep and now right now the wool market is non-existent I mean we've got lots of wool in storage but because of that that commitment to quality in that one piece of, of our business which is a very small piece but it still is sufficient um, you know in, in addition to our bottom line just paying attention to that um, has uh, has added significantly to the last couple of years as we worked into a deal um, with a company uh, that buys our wool direct now they actually found us on Instagram um, and now we're selling our wool direct to this company and we have a, a contract um, based off of the Australian market versus the American market the reason we did that is it's a more consistent market with world trends um, in the United States it goes up and down like crazy we wanted something that was fair for everybody involved so we decided to base it off of that contract but the point I'm making here is if we had gone away from ma from maintaining that wool quality we wouldn't have been offered this deal which has added a premium to our wool and actually allowed us to sell it at this and, point in time. and Jeff just a question there if I if I might um, because you're keeping track of those fine for those higher quality wool producing ewes, does that weigh into your calling decisions? If all things being equal in a, and you don't have enough feed resources, is that one of the things you would call for? So 100%, and that's, that's, something, that's something on my list here, but even more important, it, we're gonna talk about sheep way too much. Um, <laughs> even more importantly here on the sheep side, foot rot is a huge issue. Um, in California and fine wool sheep tend to have a greater incidence of foot rot. So what we've tried to do with our EIDs um, and in our U flock is sort based off of wool quality, um, fertility, um, and foot quality. Um, so it, just to give you an example, I mean, in the last five years, so when I started, we were trimming 100% of our sheep. Um, we were sorting what at the time looked like the best white face use and turning white face bucks out with them. Now they they have to have perfect feet. They have to have not be, you know, not been trimmed. Um, they had to, we don't really um, require them to have multiples like a lot of breeders do because we think a lot of that has to do with feed resources and basically how well they flush up. We think a lot of, a lot of our sheep have the ability to have multiples and honestly we don't want multiples in all our sheep because then it increases your labor to a point and there is a tipping point there um, but so we will sort off a of feet wool um, and fertility now and so we record that data on the eid tag um, or not on the eid tag but we use that tag to record that data into our software program that manages all the data for us and i'm able to go in there and build reports of the use the exact use i want to sort into that white-faced uh, maternal flock to produce our replacement females that'll go back into our flock. So, um, and what we do there is I, we bought this machine out of New Zealand um, and it's called a farm quip auto drafting um, sheep handler. And what that does is it allows me to plug my computer in. I have a preset criteria for the sheep that are running through it and it will sort everything that I want for based off of feet, wool, whatever criteria I set automatically, it's all air driven um, and it has an EID scanner on it and everything. So you basically need one guy and a dog, set it up to start working and the sheep just feed through and it'll auto draft and sort those sheep. But uh, you know, two things that's done is it's reduced labor because I can run that deal by myself. And secondly, it's helped us to just completely narrow down that flock to the absolute best producing animals and use those to produce our replacements. Um, and that, that right there has just been uh, a tremendous advantage um, as we move forward. I mean, we reduced our foot rot trimming from 99% down to 18%, um, which is a huge cost saving in everything from antibiotics to labor. Um, so, um, I mean, so as I, as I talk about the changes, I mean, everything kind of falls back to that, 
management system and, and it's the tags, it's the software. Um, and it really matters what software you use because I don't have time to sit and do a lot of data entry or make sure a spreadsheet's formatted correctly to fit into this program and that program. So we did a lot of research uh, before we kind of dove into this management system. And we actually bought a completely different system to start out with. And then we basically threw it in the trash when we found a, a, better, a better way of operating. But it, it has saved me a tremendous amount of time. Um, and it's well worth it. Um, you know, and, and back on that, uh, that uh, push to keep those efficient animals, um, you know, just being able throughout the year, if it, you have a problem with a cow, um, or you for that matter, put a note on her, an alert. And when she runs through the chute, it'll yell at you, Hey, sell me, you know, so you're sorting <laughs> those out. And I'm serious and get, you know, getting rid of those as they come through the year. And it, it, you're only running animals, um, that are, that are helping, helping to make you money. Um, the other thing we did was we reduced our calving season, uh, from 120 days, uh, to 60. Um, in our, and this is, I'm talking about our maternal Angus cow herd. Now, um, we still have a, like about five to 7% uh, of our terminal herd that is calving from 60 to 120. So we do have a four month calving window on those. Um, and I'm working on reducing that as we speak. I think next year we may be down to 90, but what we'll do is on that Angus herd, because they're producing our replacement females, the only heifers that are going into that herd our gene max advantage tested. We call the bottom 5% of that. Um, and I don't pay too much attention, honestly, to that gene max data as of now, because I've seen too many fluctuations in actual, between actual performance and what those uh, DNA tests will tell you. I think you have a lot better chance of making a, a sound uh, decision based off of pedigree than uh, you do anything else uh, that combined with actual production information. So those heifers are sorted for that. Um, we'll AI all the heifers, and then um, when I get the data back from the gene max, I'll sort through all the heifers that took to that first AI uh, based upon their sire, and I'm choosing heifers out of the bulls that I want the replacement females out of. Um, and so those heifers are the ones that are making it into that maternal herd, and that maternal herd is getting more efficient like, drastically. I mean, uh, we just preg checked all our heifers for this year. Um, actually I should say second calvers. So they're bred back with their second calf. I had a hundred percent conception rate. Um, and I don't expect to get that again, but I'm just saying we, we, we've had a, an upward trend, um, in that. And I think it's due to just calling hard, like Joe says, and honestly, we're a customer of Joe's just because of that. I went to his place, looked at his cows. They were efficient. Uh, they were uh, packed with performance and, ju you know, there, there wasn't anything on there. Man, his donor cows were nicer than anything we had on the ranch. So, um, you know, it gives you a lot of confidence in a program like that because the last thing you want to do, um, I mean, genetics are so important. It's, it's incredible. Almost all these changes I'm talking about relate back to genetics. And, and uh, that's why we'll spend a little money on, on bulls and rams to get the right genetics that we want. But um, the worst thing you can do is to try and be cheap when you're developing replacement uh, animals for your herd um, and and end up with some poor footed, uh, you know, hard doing, hard doing animals. So um, uh, I think that's a that's a, a great addition to thinking about the land resources um, as well, because everything kind of has to fit together. And I I know we're coming up on quarter to two now. I would kind of like to turn just to what the last six, eight months have looked like for all of you. Um, you know, it's been, a, I think, one of the strangest years I've ever experienced in terms of feed production and, and precipitation. Um, what have the last eight months looked like for you in terms of coping with, with that variability? Jeff, maybe, maybe throw that out to you to start. Um, basically, um... <laughs> we have kind of a, a good management team here. I work very closely with the owner and he is extremely optimistic um, almost all the time. And I am extremely pessimistic almost all the time. And so um, 
it, we kind of bounce off each other. So before, before we really were in a hard drought here this last year, I was saying, Oh, we need to wean calves early. We need to have a plan. We might need to move cattle to irrigated past, you know, all these things. And he's like, Jeff, relax. The rain always comes, you know, we'll get more rain in February. We'll come March 1st. We were shipping cattle to irrigated pasture. We were weaning Angus calves a month early. Um, and luckily we have that, that asset of that irrigated pasture to move to and to do that to give that dry ground a rest um, but I mean for us being a commercial operation we operate at our max capacity all the time I mean if we we for us to be as as efficient as possible we need to feed a little bit of hay I hate buying and feeding hay but if we're not feeding a little bit we're not at that maximum you know that maximum stocking rate at that, that point um, so um, moving cattle, like I said, out of the dry grounds, weaning, weaning cattle, we wean lambs early, um, and concentrating on, uh, on weed control, um, and spraying weeds, um, and making sure we keep what pasture we have. We went through and pulled fire breaks, uh, the last, uh, over the last few weeks on everything we have to protect what we still have. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's, that's basically what we've done is wean early, move stuff off that we could. Um, and then we're calling hard this year. We're mouthing and bagging out all the, the cows that we don't normally uh, do that, but we're, we're calling really hard this year. So Great. And I think the other key point there, and, and maybe Spencer or Melissa and, and Joe will talk on this too, you know, having somebody to talk those decisions over with helps, whether it's somebody internal to your business or, or somebody kind of as a local support group really seems to be valuable in that regard too. Uh, Melissa, how what's the last six eight months been like for you guys? Um, we going into the fall. We were uh, really nervous about our home pastures because we count on having those for the majority of the dry land areas for uh, lambing on in the spring, and they need to kind of last us between lambing and shearing, and then after that the sheep can be off. But um, we had <laughs> we had decided to hit a lot of them harder over the summer with our dry cows um, to try to get a little more impact because we struggle with um, we came into this property had been sitting for 10 years and um, well it, not just sitting and it had cattle on it seasonally but really in a not the kind of management that would have been ideal um, and so we have a lot of Medusa head that wants to take over uh, so we decided to like really hit some of those pastures that we would normally not have um, taken down that low. So we came into the fall and we we're like, you know, that first rain was great, but um, like he was saying, we Spencer's very optimistic usually, and I'm super pessimistic. So it actually <laughs> works out really well because it, it does uh, balance out. But um, for the sheep, we, we had them on a grazing project in the winter and we ended up extending that. Um, like we had hoped to have them there for like a month and then pull them off and bring them home. Um, and we just ended up keeping them there almost all the way to landing. So they came back home a lot later than, um, and it worked out, you know, it was not ideal for sure, but, um, it, it worked out to have them there because the landowner had a, a much larger area than they had originally, you know, they wanted to focus on their orchard. Um, but we were, they also were happy to have fuel load reduced. Um, we, so that kind of, with the sheep, it was a little, I think our, our planning for next year will be different in that respect. Um, we're just not going to count on that uh, winter feed being here necessarily, but we probably also aren't going to hit our pastures over the summer um, that hard with the dry cows, um, just in case. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we're trying to focus on the... Uh, um, Home place essentially being saved for the cows at this point um, for this year. Uh, like we would normally run a little tiny flock of um, lambs to finish on irrigated pasture and we're uh, not planning on doing that. We're planning on just focusing on the dairy cows having access to it. Um, and we, you know, going into the dairy, coming from that situation and uh, seeing what happened with the, the drought as it you know played out in the little spot that we were in San Benito, we um, decided it would be better to have 
more of a high input system for the dairy cows just in case. So um, in a good year, we can, you know, go from like, say, you know, early March um, through to irrigation season, which for us, um, you know, sometimes we can almost make it, you know, through May before we're really irrigating full time. Um, we, you know, we, we wouldn't be feeding very much, if any, hay in a good year um, during those like three months or so. And we've decided that every year we're going to buy enough hay so that if we have to feed hay all the way through to irrigation season, you know, just hay, if we're not counting on our, our dry land pasture at all, we can do that because for us, the, um, you know, we're essentially feeding to what you would for the uh, needs of a finisher or, you know, we're, we're making milk is a very high uh, nutrient demand. Um, so we, we really have to make sure that they, they are able to meet those needs uh, year round. So we just count on, we essentially count on drought every year. <laughs> and when we get a good rain, we don't have to feed hay. It's, it's uh, awesome. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we rely on that uh, milk production for our, our income. And so um, we can destock to a certain, uh, you know, degree, like we did destock in the fall. We, um, pulled some heifers and uh, um, steers that we had planned to raise longer and we thought you know well they've got enough finish that they're not going to be icky they're still going to taste good and so um, we got them out of here and we uh, destocked both of our bulls um, but we we're limited because we don't have a big herd you know we're running like probably for now max of like 20 animals which is really almost uh, being overstocked for what we have um, so our, our six to, to 10 cows in milk is a pretty tiny, um, pretty tiny for, you know, for being a dairy anyway. So we really can't go through and, and cull heavily. Um, but we also, I, I know Joe talked a lot about um, genetics and being adapted to your location. And that's another reason we have to be really careful about our culling because at this point we, um, you know, we need to make sure we have that milk production um, and we don't want to get rid of our you know if we've got a cow that we're really happy with um, we're not going to be able to go out and buy you know say down the road we need to uh, increase production we can't buy a cow like that like we we need her heifers um, and the idea of replacing her is really uh, unrealistic because they're we're just starting to get to a point here where we've got cows that are more adapted to what we grow here. They're adapted to our weather, to the dryland range, to the irrigated pasture. Um, so when we cull, we're, uh, we're not going to look at that dairy herd first. We're going to look at our um, animals that are, you know, young stock or bulls or, well, some bulls, <laughs> um, and uh, try to figure out a way to maintain the health of the land and that primary milking herd. It's really, it's a very tiny operation compared to uh, Joe's and Jeff's, but um, kind of, you know, similar principles apply to it. The principles are the same. Absolutely. Thank you. Joe, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let you bat last here and kind of wrap us up and, and we've got a couple of questions, but what's, what's been different these last six, eight months? So I'll even step back though and, and take a little broader view, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Um, what's been really different since the 2015 drought is, uh, I'll, I'll call it, uh, you know, I, I don't know if everyone here is familiar. I'm sure you guys are, but Whitby versus Watby. And, and in the winter months, a lot of us, get, that's when ranchers take the time to work on the operation and on the business instead of in the business. And the, the balance of the year is the Whitby that's working in the business. And if we want to improve our give, business. Give me an example of each. What would be an example of, of so, uh, on the for, business? For us, working in the business would be going and preg checking cows. Okay. Working on the business <clears throat> is sitting down and collaborating with your management team and coming up with the decision to pregnancy check cows. Okay. That would be working on the business. Right. And um, in order to come up with those new innovative techniques to improve your business and improve your efficiencies and your bottom line, that's a lot better served when it's been raining for eight hours and you can't do anything and you don't have to worry about your livestock because they're out grazing and then laying down and ruminating and going on. But when you're stretched because the day length is 
is long, or well, I guess the daylight's short, but there's plenty of usable hours to do some sort of actual physical ranch improvement. Yeah, I, I think it's hard for most ranchers to carve out that time to sit in an office and work on business decisions. And so we've seen that gamut through not just our own operation here at Bruin, but in a lot of our customers' operations too, and a lot of breeder fatigue, I'll call it. People that haven't been able to step back and and find any sort of reprieve from actual physical work. Um, and, and a lot of times when you have plenty of feed for your cattle and they aren't getting out or you know aren't short of feed you don't have to move them that's when you get that time to spend time with family or to work on the business and so there's been a lot of collateral damage that's come with with the uh unpredictable weather, weather patterns of the past 10 12 years i suppose you'd say in the past six months it's it's been a whipsaw of management decisions like i said earlier in my opening remarks we've gone from thinking we don't have nearly enough cattle um, to how are we going to be able to stock all these ranches to now we have way too many and now we just got three inches of rain um, here at Auburn um, another ranch got a little bit of rain another ranch got a little bit of rain I mean so now I have more stock drinking water at a place um, in Lincoln than I had in January and had to come off of that ranch and so um, it's been challenging challenging to say the least um, I had a note here. How is this one different? Um, I think it's different because they've all been different. Um, I, I can't think even 2012 was the first one that really, really, that was the, around the time. And that might've been 14 that I sent you the picture of just mountains of lick tubs that we were feeding cattle. And I just said, we're never going to do this again. Um, but this one's been different because on paper, we've pr received plenty of precipitation, I believe. And, and on um, SF Rex forage clippings, it's going to say that we have ample forage. Um, but did that forage come in a pattern that was usable enough for our livestock? I don't know. So it set us down a road of different management decisions and different management strategies. And, and I actually said to a gentleman I was talking to on the phone, I said, if this was the 1800s, by now, I'm pretty sure some old ranchers would get some exotic seed from South Africa or something, and they'd be broadcasting it out and plowing it in, and they'd be trying something. Well, that's what we're doing here at Bruin Ranch right now. We have a cocktail mix of other um, forages that we're using in a small-scale planting and just trying to see how we can add in more drought-resilient forages that also have nutritional value because one of the struggles you'll find is that a lot of the forages that are drought resilient, aren't terribly nutritionally beneficial or palatable to livestock. But um, there have been um, forages shown that can do a little bit of both. And, and I think we're going to go to more of a forb based diet for a lot of our livestock and deeper rooted plants and, and see if we can just mix in the diversity of our range. And we start with our irrigated pasture and then try to creep onto some of our deeded ground. I'm not going to go to leased ground and start changing the dynamic of pastures because usually folks don't like you doing that and rightfully so. But on our own deeded ground, we will, we will toy around with additional plantings and different stuff because like I said before, you could choose to be a victim of this or you can choose that this is the environment we are choosing to live in. Um, one other thing I'd add, and I know we're pushing up against two o'clock, Dan, I'm sorry. First of all, Good. if nobody else has been on the Zoom before, down at the bottom, which I'm sure most of you, if I see some of these names, you guys have been on them more than me, but down at the bottom, there's a chat box, and Leslie has been um, corresponding with a lot of us. If it has a little number like your iPhone or your Droid would have on it, click on that. That means you haven't read it, but get us some questions, because I know both, I know Jeff and Melissa will do better with questions than we do with prompts, even though Dan's doing a great job. Um, but uh, I think we need to plan for more inclement weather all the time. And we've had ranches that are our best cow ranches were the worst this year. And our headquarters in Auburn, California is traditionally one of the worst ranches I've ever run cattle on in terms of forage production and quality forage. And by far, it's the best ranch we've had. Now, some of that is that's been under our management scheme for the past 15 years. And we've been able to probably change the ability of our, our soil to capture water and, and our residual feed has always been there and that sort of thing. 
but some of it is just the pattern of the rainfall and and how the weather has been and and I've had a lot of people tell me just as, as simple as this is. And if somebody's from around here, they said, man, our country is acting a lot more like what Red Bluff used to mm -hmm. act like. And um, I think that's a really astute observation. And a lot of other folks that I send bulls to in the Bakersfield, um, Glenville area, they say, you know, we've always had good year, bad year, good year, bad year, you know, but the trend has always been going, it, it's been going down. And um, I'm not bold enough to say that's desertification yet, but I am saying that, that I think that everyone needs to pay attention to their forage. And, and if you can't already tell, you have a panel of pessimists. And uh, <laughs> I, I might be the president and CEO of that. And uh, <laughs> luckily, there have been plenty of other people that I surround myself with that probably don't worry as much and have a little bit more faith than I will that it'll rain. But um, 2014, 12 and 14 particularly, um, those kind of told me that I can hope for it to rain and it just might not too, or it'll rain in July and leach, leach out all the nutrients, any feed that you have that's, that's saved. And that's probably, that's probably what's is interesting <clears throat> to discuss as anything that we've dealt with is we can deal with below average precipitation and the timing of the rains. But this is the third year in the row that we've had a pile of rain after the first of May when most of our winter forages have set seed. And so, yes, some of the ryegrass that we aggressively grazed looks pretty darn good right now. But a lot of our other dry feed went from that really beautiful golden brown or light lime green color to clear in about 24 hours. Yep. And so... Um, that's definitely a concern to, to see that pattern develop. And, and I don't know how long it takes for, for nature to see a shift in the type of, of plants that will dominate a landscape with that kind of rain. But I think it's, it's definitely an observation to note. I've noticed something kind of, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. I was just gonna say, I've noticed uh, something interesting over the past couple of uh, rainy seasons and springs that are, some of our native plants are actually look like they're happier. We've seen some places we're getting a little more uh, native perennial grasses coming up. And a part of me wonders if, uh, you know, all these introduced species, like, um, you know, as the climate gets a little, maybe it's, maybe this is more normal for California, you know, who knows, but the, um, some of that native stuff seems to be pretty happy with the way the weather is. Um, and like Joe said, he's, you know, trying experimental seeding. We're, we're going to do the same thing this fall and see if we can get some uh, taprooted stuff in our uh, dry land areas um, that will do better with the heat and better with crummy rain. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to see if that helps at all. Jeff, real quick, you have something to add to that? Um, you know, we actually planted... 160 acres this year in um, some different uh, brassicas and, um, and and just you know some different uh, clover like some dryland alfalfa. Um, we're we're just trying um, and that was biosolid ground. I didn't mention earlier, but we we rotate uh, biosolid application through about a third of our ground. Um, and we'll, it'll, we'll go back to a field every five years and reapply. Um, but that right there doubles our carrying capacity on that ground. And especially during these drought years, um, it, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's basically just adding a bunch of nitrogen, um, and organic material to the soil. And when you get a little bit of rain, the forage coming up may just be foxtail, but it's coming like crazy and the tonnage is there to where, I mean, it literally is, is, uh, we can run on our normal dry ground. We'll run oh, one pair to 13 to 15 acres. Um, and on that, uh, biosolid ground, it'll be one pair to six acres. Um, so that's been, that's been a tremendous, uh, asset to us as we look at drought. So, well, I know we're we're a little past two o'clock. I, I we do have a few questions that have come in, and I think we'll we'll try to respond to some of those um, with our our YouTube video. Um, if you go to UC Rangelands on uh, on YouTube, looks like Joe's assistant just came in to help. Um, we will we will post the video. Go ahead, Joe. 
I brought props. Sorry to <laughs> So we will we will post these questions on YouTube and we'll get our panelists to to help answer them. There was a question about um, why there's no drought showing on the map for Southern California. Um, frankly, Southern California got rain that we didn't get in Northern California this year. Um, but we do have a network of cooperative extension folks and others that that coordinate on reporting to the U.S. Drought Monitor. And you all on this on this webinar can report directly to the Drought Monitor with your own observations. Um, so I'd encourage you to think about doing that. You can check out the UC Rangelands um, Drought Information Hub online as well. And uh, Joe, you had a prop that you wanted to share. Yeah, do you want me to tackle this question in the chat box from uh, Sheila Berry? Yeah, yeah, please. So uh, yep. Sheila, if this was directed at me, I this is one of the companies that we use. Um, we use John Schilling here in our local area and he orders from PGG Seeds. And um, you'll see there's a whole pile of different forages here. We, uh, we planted the, the latest cocktail mix that we planted. I love chicory. Chicory is great because um, it, under, under just low moisture situations, it's still growth and it's still life in the soil. And, um, and it's a perennial. I have a couple two, three-year-old chicory plants. And I know Jeff's probably looking at me like, seriously, Joe, you run 8,000 acres and you have like three chicory plants. <laughs> uh, we did, the deer and, and then the native species hammer those things. And so I was really frustrated by that because it, it's really expensive seed. And uh, a friend of mine who has a, a lot more holistic view than I did said, well, you know, if, if the deer are ham hammering it, then it's probably good forage. And so there you go. So I keep planting uh, chicory whenever I can. Um, I don't know, I think it's Hun uh, Winfred, but there's Hunter and Winfred brassicas that are turnips and they're basically an improved mustard. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, please. They're improved mustard that, that is um, a grazing um, turnip, basically. I mean, they can develop like if you have the right right soil profile, you can develop a Coke can taproot that goes down. So I wanted to have that to break up compaction. Um, I really try not to use tractors just because in our environment, um, it's not going to do anything but grow rocks. And so, Joe, we, real, real quick, Joe, let me. Do you pull fire breaks on your places? We do not. We do not. Um, now, some of them, yes. So. A leased place that we have with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, those landlords pull a fire break. And then a place that we have in Grass Valley, they pull a fire break. But, you know, at, at Bruin, short of lightning or the golf course, we basically don't have much fire risk. So right centrally around the golf course and those locations, we'll, we'll napalm the cattle pretty pretty hard. I mean, we, we centrally locate there pretty heavily. Um, we also put in Piper Sedan and a Japanese millet, um, both which are warm season um, annual uh, species. And we also did, um, I'm trying to find it in here and I can't, Graza radish. Is that right, Dan? Graza? Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. It's like a grazing turnip. Um, but when you look at the tonnage and what those things can produce and the nutritional value, um, it's pretty interesting to see what their plumage can do. And so we're, we're just trying them out here. And I think that we're going to have to do more and more of that. You know, I talked about um, snowpack. Another, another drought strategy I have is developing great relationships with all of our landlords and our water agencies. Um, if we're there to support and help those guys in terms of and gals in terms of what they need for resources in good years as well as bad years, then um, they really listen to our needs and, and they want to listen to our needs anyways. But if you aren't, you know, I've heard it say it's so it's so true. If you aren't at the table, you're on the plate. <laughs> and um, so I like to sit at the table and, and, and help craft those hard decisions with folks and be a resource to them in the local community. And, and luckily, both Nevada Irrigation District and PCWA's Placer County Water Agency have been really receptive to continue to make those water deliveries available to producers in, in times of inclement weather. I would say that's a fair characteristic, wouldn't you, Dan? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm going to bring us to a close today. I really want to thank you, Melissa and Joe and Jeff, for spending an afternoon um, on a clear day where you could be out doing real work. But thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, thank you for those of us, those of you who joined us today. 
We will get a video of this webinar posted on the UC Rangelands YouTube site by the end of the week. Our next Working Rangelands Wednesday webinar, which is difficult to say fast, uh, will be on June 3rd at one o'clock and uh, we'll have Dr. Ken Tate talking about um, water quality on pasture and rangeland. So we'll be staying with that, with that uh, topic. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you especially to our panelists today for, for lending your expertise. Thank Have a great you. rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.